coming to you live from the Mill Ford Tall Studio. Boomer and Sai St. Greg Giannotti. It's Boomer and Geo on the fan. Simulcast across the country on CBS Sports Network. And wherever you are on the free Odyssey app. Good Monday morning. Boomer out one more day. We'll be back tomorrow. We did not get the neurovirus. Multiple people asked me on social media. Did Boomer finally get the neurovirus? No, he has been away uh, with some uh, buddies on a trip playing golf in a wonderful location. I got a video, a couple of videos from him over the weekend. So he's enjoying himself. He will be back tomorrow. That means that Jerry is back in again this morning. What's up, Jerry? Gee, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Did you get wrapped up in all the snubbing yesterday? Because I feel like this is an every year thing that we have these conversations. This team should have been in. That team should have been in. But obviously, it was a much more of a local tinge to it this time around with St. John's and Seton Hall not making in on Selection Sunday. And I do feel bad for the fans of those teams, especially the hardcore, the the real base of these these two schools. These fan bases are great. They're loyal. And I know for a fact that St. John's fans have been through hell and back for many years. And this was supposed to be a Rick Patino comes in, they go to the tournament type of year, and here they are. They're not in the tournament, but... You've got to leave no doubt, man. This is what this... You have to leave no doubt if you're St. John's. And unfortunately, that stretch that they went through before the press conference where Rick Pitino tore everybody down and said he was so unhappy, that stretch there is what cost them a bid into the tournament. Yeah, I I guess. To me, you know, a lot of people complain about stuff and and they don't really come up with solutions. So I'm here to try and come up with a solution. A solution, huh? Because I think it sucks that St. John's isn't in the field of 68. It's not a field of 64. It's 68. I think it sucks, not that I watch them, but a team like Indiana State is not in the field of 68. I'm only familiar with them because of Al uh, they did. They were in the top 25 as recently as February, and I know they lost a couple of games. They got bounced out. I think it sucks that a team like Seton Hall is not in the field of 68. And so you sit there and say, so what's the solution? Because there were five of these tournaments yesterday that stole bids. So if we're going to use the net ranking, which is basically we're in, a, we're in an era of stats and analytics. Would you not agree? Yeah, of it's course. It's all about the numbers. So if we're going to use net rankings for a lot of what we do now in terms of quad one wins, quad two wins, strength of schedule, to determine who are the best teams in college basketball, then let's use them. So a team like Indiana State that has a net ranking of 29, which means they should be, theoretically, the 29th best team in the country, how are they not in the field of 68? If St. John's has a net ranking of 32, how are they not in the field of 68? Because so the, the guys who say, pick the teams don't use that. So... <laughs> No, that's no, why. I, I, and that, and they should. And yeah. that's how it should be. If the rankings tell me the 29th best team in the country is not good enough to be one of the 68 teams, then get rid of it all. And let's just make it an eye test thing. But well, and that's what Rick Pitino said. We should never mention the net ranking again because it's, or, it's a useless. Or we should, and we should use it to put the right teams in. All right, so you sit there and say, well, but what about the automatic bids? I look at it this way. Here's my solution, okay? And you tell me if this is so far out of reach and so far-fetched that it's stupid. You've got 32 conferences in Division I basketball. Yes? Correct? 32? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. We take 32 spots automatically. We set them aside for the automatic bids. Now, a lot of those are going to be teams that are going to make it anyway because Mm -hmm. they're great teams and they're going to wind up in in the top 68 anyhow. You take those 32 bids aside. That leaves 36 spots. The 36 top teams in the country automatically are in the NCAA tournament. That's it. They are the top 36 teams. You're leaving the other 32 for the automatic bids. You're going to have a lot of crossover, which then allows 37, 38, 39, 40. And you go as far down the list as you can. Yeah, you're going to get snubbed because of these automatic bids from the the lesser conferences from time to time. But it's not going to be a team that's got a ranking of 29 as opposed to a team that's, you know, 55. That, to me, is where a bad stretch can hurt you and should hurt you. Not a team that's 29th or 32nd for a field of 68. This isn't the NIT where they take 32 teams. It's 68 teams, and you're going to tell me Seton Hall, St. John's, and Indiana State shouldn't be in that in the field? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's really who you take out. And a team like Virginia, who didn't seem to earn it based on the analytics, is one that drives you crazy. They shouldn't be in there. But here's what you do if you end up going with the, the, the pure analytics and the, the net rankings and all that stuff. It becomes the BCS that everybody hated. 
where the uh, the human in the room doesn't count anymore. It's all just computer analytics stuff. And that's why college football ended up coming up with this committee because what was going on with the numbers and the computers and the analytics wasn't working for most people. So, I mean, there's going to be – the bottom line is – your idea may work better and may make people feel better in a year like this, but every year is different, and there's going to be times when people are going to be like, analytically, that team says that they're this good, but this team here is so much better than them, and if we keep going by the computer and don't use humans, then we're never going to get the best Here's teams the in. difference. The BCS and football, we weren't talking about 68 teams. Yeah, This is a sure. large field. And this, my way of doing things, is very black and white. And while you're right, it takes a little bit of the, the eye test off the, off the table and out of the equation, I really do believe that there are so many teams we're talking about that, you know what, if your ranking is 53rd and you don't get in, eh, like there's got to be a line drawn in the same. Like you're talking about a team, and again, I didn't watch them. I don't know a whole hell of a lot about them other than what Al, when Al talked about them. Like Indiana State, they're in the top 50% of all teams in the country. They're not top 50. They're top 30. And they're not in. Like St. John's is 32. Out of 68 teams, you're in the top 50%. And they, they're not in. Well, the fact that the Big East, which is still the best basketball conference out there, I don't care what anybody says, uh, the fact that they only got three teams and then UConn got the hardest, well, on paper, the hardest route to the Final Four is, I mean, that's tough for the, the conference. I mean, if I'm the Big East commissioner, I'm mad about that. Um, but, I mean, that that to me is probably the bigger story is the fact that here you are in, in the most competitive league uh, and you only have three representatives that that were top 25 teams the entire time. And they're beating each other up. I mean, you had two bad teams in the conference period. Maybe three. I guess Butler wasn't very good this year. But everybody else is beating each other up. You had Seton Hall, who beat UConn. You had St. John's, who took UConn to the brink, not once, but twice. And UConn's the number one overall seed in the entire yeah. tournament. And those teams aren't in. So, yes, it, it is frustrating. And if you're a Seton Hall fan, if you're a Big East fan, if you're a St. John's fan, if you're an Indiana State grad and fan, then I can understand why you're pissed off this morning. But one thing that does drive me crazy is when someone doesn't have an allegiance to these teams in any sort of way and is screaming about it just for the sake of screaming about it. Like, come on. There are so many years where I don't have a personal connection to this and a team gets screwed. I couldn't give two craps about it. This year I happen to. Because St. John's mm-hmm. wanted them to be in a tournament. But quite frankly, you know, I mean, there there was that stretch there that they were so bad that I already mentally counted them out. Gee, they're every team, aside from the top 10 teams in the country, and even those teams have a little bit of a peak in a valley. I'm t- I've been around this now for eight years at the Big Ten yeah. level. All teams have peaks and valleys in the season. They really do. I mean, if you look at, and I know... You know, Wisconsin almost won the the Big Ten tournament. You look at the way their season went, they were brutal. They got to, I think they were eighth in the country at one point. And then they went through a swoon where I think they lost five of six. They looked terrible. Then they finished well. Ohio State fired their coach. They were so bad. Yeah, but they finish on an upswing. It just it happens. But but when with every Saint, program. But St. John's was never good at. I mean, I don't even remember them even being ranked. I mean, were they like twenty third at one point not, during the season? I'm not saying they were ranked. Like, I'm saying no, but, every team goes through. Yeah, it. but but when you're a team, right? Every team goes through swoons. But when you're a team that's good enough to be in the top ten then you're going to get more of a benefit of a doubt than a team that that maybe, I don't even remember, had a cup of coffee in the top 25 the entire year. And yet they won 20 games and they're ranked 32nd in the country. Yeah, by, by thi- but they're ranked 32nd in the country. Statistically. Right, by something that doesn't matter. So but that should matter because but, that's what it's created for. If it doesn't matter, then what's it there for? I That's exactly what Rick Pitino is talking about. It, it doesn't right. matter. There's, so, there's no point. They, they're so, a 20-win team out of the Big East that doesn't make the NCAA tournament with a net ranking of 32, it's ridiculous. Well, they don't, well, they don't look at it. They don't, they don't care. I mean, so that's what Rick Pitino's point is that they should never use that again. And your point is that it should be based off of that. But the way that they're doing it now – is the fact that they don't care about right. that. It should never be used again if they're not going to use it. Yeah. And I'm saying use the damn thing, and you'll get the best teams in the tournament with those. You know, the one thing about those fun stories, I've always been one that has said, 
while it's fun to see the lower conferences get that automatic bid, I've always been like, but they have zero chance of winning the tournament, and I, I, I didn't like it. And then you have the run by St. Peter. So you do get the stories from time to time. I understand why they do it. It's great, fantastic. The way I'm saying to put these teams into the tournament, you still go, th- you still get those fun stories, but you get the best possible field you can. Yeah, and it's frustrating too because if you get one of those at large bids, even if you're in the the first four, like a team like St. John's that ended on an upswing and was playing very very well. I mean, I, I, there's there's no way that that team couldn't have won a couple of games no in the question. tournament and given a fan base a run to possibly a Sweet 16 that you haven't seen in forever. That would have been great. So that that's what's that's what's truly frustrating about it. And the fact that they weren't even considered for a first four is ridiculous. Is as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's it is it is very frustrating. And, and it feels like, you know, regardless of if they should have been in or not, you know, it feels like this first year Rick Patino unfortunately fell short and was a failure. Because the the biggest headlines that they made was him trashing the team, saying how miserable he was, and now they're sitting here with no postseason play. I don't blame him for turning down the NIT. I know some people get annoyed with that. This team is going to be completely different next year. This isn't 1983 where these guys are going to be staying together for four years and the nah. tournament experience is going to be something that helps them out. It's going to be a completely different team next year. Wait till you see how many kids enter the transfer portal today. I yeah. believe it opens today, and you're going to have hundreds on day one enter. I mean, I, I could understand understand if you're telling me like oh it's a young team they're going to stick together and the experience they get in playing in the tournament is going to help them next year that that doesn't exist anymore in college basketball. 10 years ago it's a good idea yeah now if you want to play in the nit i say go for it the field's actually really good it is a fun tournament but i also don't have a problem with the team turning it down exactly for the reason you just said you're gonna have kids probably just going through the motions, waiting for their season to end so they can enter the damn portal and get their life going again. <laughs> right, right. Or or there's other kids who may be talented enough to go into the draft that are on teams that didn't make it that are like, what, what the hell am I going to be playing in the NIT for? It's sure. just absolutely no reason. Uh, the best that the worst that can happen is that I get hurt, and the best that, I get, that, get, that can happen is that we win the NIT, which doesn't mean anything in the long run. So yeah, it 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 is annoying. And if I'm Rick Pitino, I just here's the thing I worry about with with Rick Pitino and St. John's is as a St. John's guy, is that okay? So he admittedly he talked about how unhappy he was for whatever reasons the most uh, the least enjoyable season of his life. All right, so you've got that, you've got him being older. You also have now him with the transfer portal stuff, which every head coach who's been around college sports these days hates. Yeah, and you're awful. seeing guys retire all over the place in college basketball and college football. Now you've got his team as a 32 net ranked team who doesn't get in. And he's talking about how fraudulent and stupid that is. Does he want to stick around for three, four, five years with all this crap that's going on? Like, if this first season is any indication of whether or not he's in for the long haul, well, hell, I don't think he's going to be in for the long haul. Like, if this team had gotten in, went on a run, sweet six, he'd be re-energized. I'm thinking he comes out of the season going, I don't, I don't know how long I could do this. Yeah, the only thing I would say to the contrary is it's in his blood. I mean, this is what he does. And I know it's in that Nick Saban's uh, blood. It was yeah, in Jay well, Wright's but hold blood. Hold on a second. He <laughs> He also wasn't at the high level for a long time. I mean, he took a little detour (laughs) for several years, Um, not to mention being in Italy, I believe, for a few years. Greece, coaching there. I do think that it still gets him. I still think he gets a rush from doing it. I think watching him on the – you watched him in that Seton Hall game, and I didn't see that whole game, but I saw a a good portion of it. He's as into it. You know, from the opening tip to the final buzzer, he looks like he's 20 years younger. The UConn game, you're going to tell me his juices weren't flowing for that game. Um, So I I would not, I would be stunned, to be quite honest with you, if he wasn't here for at least a few years. I really think this is what he wants, where he wants to be and what he wants to do. Yeah, and and I understand that he's still going to be into it. And and as you say, his his juices were flowing for sure. But I just think that there's been a lot of frustration on his part. And then just watching that Zoom call that he did uh, with that horrible background. I don't know if you saw I the did not visual see, I only heard it. I didn't see it. It's like, I mean, it was just, it was Madison Square Garden from a sky view that was blurry. Oh. Is what, what his background was when he did this interview. The the visual just looked ridiculous. Uh, and him, him talking about this is fraudulent and that's fraudulent and this stinks. And, but, ah, but we're not going to complain about it. 
uh, type of thing. I just, I, I just thought, man, like I just, I really hope that that this season didn't knock some of the passion out of them because there are examples all over college sports of guys that that just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, it's it's a different game. I will tell you from seeing and hearing things, it sucks. Like college basketball is still to me a better game to watch than the NBA because I really do feel like for the most part, kids are giving, if not 100%, very close to it for much of the 40 minutes. And I really do believe it's a better game to watch. But uh, when you get to this turnover now, it's literally free agency every single season. And I would guess that, and we'll just talk about our teams around here, St. John, Seton Hall, uh, and Rutgers. I would think out of those three teams, you're probably going to see six or seven kids on each team leave. Oh, and yeah. have six or seven new pieces in next year, which is crazy. Yeah, and, that, and that's sort of the reason why everybody was excited about Rick Pitino coming here because you could turn it around in this new world in one year. I mean, that's what everybody was thinking. It's not going to take three, four, five years to build a program up. If you get the right guys in, then bang, you're there right in the mix in one year. So there is an advantage to it if you're a program that's been down for a while. Uh, but it is very, very difficult if you don't have the funds, you don't have the coach, you don't. I mean, th- there are certain programs in this new world that had very little chance prior to this new this new way of doing things now that have zero chance. Well, it's interesting because I really did believe that things had evened itself out. We kind of went through the period of, you know, you saw the Blue Chips movie, and I believe it was oh, very, very Nick real. Nick Nolte. Yeah, when you got, you know, guys getting families, you know, getting paid with tractors and homes and cash under the table. I kind of felt like things were evening out because the – the schools that were that were doing that were paying kids under the table somehow, but it was for the one and dones. And those one and dones, while they look great on paper, a lot of times it didn't kind of come to fruition throughout the course of a full season. And you could get those teams that had built a program for three, four years that would be senior laden and been together for four years, and all of a sudden could go beat the powerhouses because of the way they did it the right way, as opposed to the quick fix type of win now mentality. Now with the way the NIL is, it has given those big teams more money than God to where they put, I mean, you can put stars at every position if you've got this collective that's got millions of dollars in it, and these other programs don't have any money. And all of a sudden, the 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 balances have shifted again, and it, it stinks. It really does. I, I don't like where it's going. I don't know if it's ever going to change. It might be for the worse. Um, some will say for the better, for the players, but I don't think it's a good thing. 